Hi, I'm Trina Satirakopoulos. I teach English here over at College of DuPage, and with me is Rachel McKibbins, all the way from New York. We're very excited to have her. Um, so she's a New York Foundation for the Arts Poetry Fellow. She's also author of two books of poetry, which is an amazing accomplishment for, you know, a modern poet, I would sure. say, besides John Keats. <laughs> um, so she has Pink Elephant and then also new release Dark and Emptying Field, Into the Dark and Emptying Field, right? Uh, for four years, McKibben's taught poetry through the Healing Arts Program at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan, and she continues to teach poetry and creative writing and give lectures across the country as an advocate for mental illness, gender equality, and victims of violence and domestic abuse. So I'm so glad you're here. Um, yes. And I know my students are so glad you're here. They'll be thrilled to talk with you tonight. Um, the first thing my creative writing students and all of our creative writing students at COD the one thing I think we all struggle with, those of us that are not poets, that maybe write fiction or nonfiction, um, we have trouble starting a poem. So how do you start a poem? I know this is so basic, but like we get lost in that, like meter and um, stanzas. And, right, right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was a short story writer initially mm -hmm. um, since I was a, a very small kid. The, the moment I learned how to write, I was writing stories. Um, kind of as, as a form of escapism. Mm -hmm. uh, the poetry didn't come until uh, 13 years ago. And what I've found is that I usually know what the end is, and I just have to figure out a way to write myself to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So I actually start a poem with the last line. Really? Um, about, I'd say, a good 80% of the time. Uh, and then I just have to figure out uh, a way to map um, you know, the, the speaker's voice into getting to that particular moment or image. Sometimes it's just based on an image. Right. Um, I do a lot of exercises for myself to kind of conjure language um, from other texts. I'll just open books and I'll read sentences backwards so that I don't get caught up in the story. I just see the words. I'm not even tied to the language. I'm just meeting the words as they are and they'll fall and I'll create an image or a word from that and and think what kind of uh, atmosphere does this image invoke yeah. and uh, go from there it's weird so <laughs> it's not, it's not that you maybe sometimes don't set out to say I'm going to write about this topic it's whatever however the topic comes to you looking it, at yeah it comes to that else. I have yes I have uh, journals and uh, my computer is filled with just pages and pages of word combinations I've come up with. Mud stitch. What's a mud stitch? It's not a real word, but it sounds like something gritty. It sounds like something that's temporarily holding something together. And then from that, that word ends up building a poem about infidelity, which is a topic I've wanted to cover. It's something that really harmed me in the past. And now I have this access, I have entry into writing about it just from that one small word. So I do that a lot. Um, with bigger topics, uh, in particular, I, I just finished a third book. It's going to come out in February called Mammoth, and it's about uh, my niece who passed away. She was 23 months old. And for a writer, you want to be able to honor you know, the person, of course, who's no longer here, because now you're kind of uh, their voice by proxy, and that's such an extreme responsibility. Um, and so meeting that, I mean, there wasn't any language for that. That kind of grief is so it's just vast, and it doesn't have any edges. It's just going and flowing and flowing. And so mm -hmm. you kind of have to chase after smaller moments. And so for that book in particular, I definitely would sit down and think, all right, what's a, a moment in that terrible week? Because uh, we had gone there to visit her and say goodbye, and then she died. So then we ended up being stuck uh, in the city way out of state, or actually it was in Ohio, and um, had to go buy funeral clothes at Walmart and like just all of these things out of our element. And, and it's just not a way that we would ever, you know, approach a funeral. Like we you know to class it up like right. New Orleans style and right. be regal with big fascinators. And instead I'm like a cardigan and slacks. And so, <laughs> Walmart. so I, I, I decided, you know, I need to write about that. Like yeah. just going to Walmart yeah. and, and that in itself being like this weird sub 
category to the bigger grief that was and just talking about how I didn't get to dress the way I wanted to for yeah. this event and just small things like that I just find little um, entrance ways into and, I, and then I just tell a story very briefly like that. Beautiful. <laughs> are you counting out, now this is a very specific question, right? Are you counting out the meter or are you just writing? Because we well, get trapped in this, you know, my students get trapped in this. It's, I mean, for me, because I've always been rhythmic mm -hmm. and I've, um, all of the meter comes very naturally for mm -hmm. me, so sometimes I have to break meter. I have to do the opposite and try to make it so it's not da 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 da, -da constantly. And um, like you just did, said 12 syllables easier, because I, I also count, I've always tapped on my fingers. Uh, and so I'm more concerned with, telling the story properly. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the times, like I choose to do uh, pantoums, which is a really, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting form because you have rolling verses. Mm -hmm. You have a line being repeated, but then mm -hmm. it has to come in and kind of change the context. And I, I find that the more, uh, Stringent, if the, there's rules to it, I, my language expands because it wants to press against, you know, like the the cage of it, and it and it definitely starts wanting to get defiant. And so, some of my best language comes from the rules of of um, particular form poetry, uh, or abiding by uh, meter. But um, it's it sounds really corny, but it's actually a very meter to me is very easy. It it's it's free verse that's that's like panic because you don't know. Okay, it's there's too much freedom, and, and you know I, I I don't know what to do with anything. Like that. So writing within the boundary is. Oh yeah, it's it's oh. for some reason it just does a thing because you know I I'm a rebel. I like to break a rule, and so okay. I'm trying to find the ways you know to, to kind of like instigate um, new approaches to a topic or. Or again, just to use a made up word, like uh, my new thing right now sounds really um, pompous, but I love spelling blood with a U instead of two O's. And that's how it's been because I think it's dirtier to me um, with the background I've had. Blood isn't necessarily, that, that's, that doesn't mean allegiance, it doesn't mean honor, it doesn't mean love. Right. Um, and so it has, it needs some grittiness to it, it needs actual dirt. And so I put blood and mud together and then that's how I've been writing blood for like the last two years. And blood appears a lot in your poetry. Well, in yeah. Elephant, it Absolutely. appears a lot, right? <laughs> how can it not? I mean, it's just such a, it, the book itself wasn't intended to be uh, Pink Elephant wasn't intended to be a memoir in verse, but right. uh, once I started calling poems and, and mapping out the story of this, I realized it had to just be me mm -hmm. as the speaker, um, because before it had a lot more of uh, the work that I tend to lean towards, which is a lot of surrealism, mm -hmm. um, a lot of magical elements mm -hmm. to it. And um, I left a few in here. I mean, I didn't really catch a mermaid, and I didn't, right. you know, and-, kind of and the other. There's one where the girl and the dog grow up together, okay, and okay. get married, and have weird children. Right. <laughs> There's a few in there, um, but I mean, they're they're also brutally honest, in my opinion. They are. So <laughs> why honesty? I mean, is there a connection, or and must honesty be present in a poem? Do you think? Um, well, I think it doesn't always necessarily. I mean, I think that ultimately, for a writer, you can't help but inject a bit of yourself mm -hmm. in something. Um, I've been asked, uh, you know, you have the, these three poems about your mother, and I correct them and I say, oh no, every poem is about my mother. Yeah. She's sometimes a barrette, she's sometimes a tooth in a drawer, mm -hmm. she's somebody, and, and that's the element of truth. Even if no one else catches it, I know it's there. And so I think that as writers, hopefully, no matter what we're writing, um, whether it's hate mail <laughs> or, you know, just a, a, you know, a poem or a short story, there's, there's going to be an element of, of our emotional truth in there. The color red means something to someone else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Maple Street has a very violent history for me, the word maple for other right. people. You know, I mean, it right, got to the right, point right. where I couldn't even uh, have syrup for a long time because of just that, that word, like just the way that we track our right. histories and our baggage. Um, and so for hit, I mean, honesty, 
you know, uh, what is it, Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carried, mm -hmm. you know, talks about emotional truth mm -hmm. sometimes being more honest uh, than the factual truth, and I 100% believe in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes, you know, uh, I'll have a mythological figure step in because that's the only way to really express the feeling of, of being feeling like only half of a person, you know, growing up in a violent household. Like, I didn't ever feel like a complete person, and so... You need the, the mermaid there. had to be, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Yeah. had to be there, and that's honesty to me. It's interesting that you say that because we had Robin Henley here for Writers Read okay. before, <clears throat> and he mentioned that as well, the, the idea that we almost need fiction to tell the truth, and you know, he talked about that fine line between, they were trying to define, Tom Fate and Robin Henley were trying to define creative nonfiction, mm -hmm. and what is really the difference between right. you know, fiction and nonfiction, and it does translate over into poetry, yeah. because that, like you're saying, this honesty, it, it, it must be there whether we're writing it as fictitious or real. Well, I'm currently writing a memoir, and just the presentation of it and the way uh, I name things, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the point of a writer really is to to testify and to name yes the things you know, mm -hmm. and so in in the memoir a lot of it uh, incorporates what many would consider to be you know just fantastical elements, but to me and especially uh, in speaking for my child self at the time like that's how I saw it and that's mm -hmm. that's reality for me and. Um, so I know that if it ever gets shopped around, it'll be creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I've let go of that because before I was like, what is this creative nonfiction? What is this? This is a terrible, yes. I don't, I didn't like the pairing, but now I understand that, um, you know, especially someone with, you know, you know, I'm, I have Mexican ancestry. I have tons of really, I think, considered those in touch with like the spiritual world and all of that. And so, um, I, you know, I've, I'm really, I can hear a lot more what's, you know, that's going on. Not to sound like, you know, creepy or anything, but I mean, I just seem to be in tune with things. And I, and I've always kind of uh, personified objects since I was little, you know. And I do that with my kids as well. And that, what that does is it builds. Um, empathy and and that's what good writing does is yeah. you will empathize with some even the worst villain uh, you know and, and I say things to my daughters like oh you're not gonna eat the other half of your sandwich he's gonna be so sad just sitting there by himself and then they're like <laughs> oh the right and so <laughs> then you know and then like they just they're more concerned with feeling and with emotion and how people are responding and how they would feel if left alone and I just really love the idea that the writing does that and fictionalizing and personification actually builds better people. Right. And um, they are the most honest little witches on the planet. I love them <laughs> to death. But I mean, the, the things they say, and it, and it definitely is with not just a poet's eye, but um, just that honest, uh, like fairy tale esque mm -hmm. thread that's just woven into their language effortlessly. It's really exciting to watch. I want to read your Sorry, I got tangent. No, your memoir. I'm like, where is that? <laughs> Ugh, Bring it out. Brutal. Um, well, I think, do you want to read then Weathers Here, Wish You Were Beautiful? I mean, if we're talking sure. about your family and we're talking yeah. about you as a mother, this is about your mother. It is right? about my mom. And it's from Pink Elephant. Yeah, this was written in uh, 2001. The book itself uh, came out in 2009. Right. Um, and... Uh, as of today, I have not seen her in, in 20 years. And uh, so writing this, I think, uh, was was my first, it was, I think it was actually, yeah, it was my first attempt ever to, to put her uh, in black and white that I think was obvious, yeah. whereas the other time she was peripheral. Right. This is very direct. Uh, Weather's here, I wish you were beautiful. There was the summer you ignored me so hard, it gave me bad posture. By fall, the chiropractor prescribed a back brace and a name tag to wear around the house. Every Christmas Eve, instead of throwing me a birthday party, you'd soak me in the bathtub fully clothed and hang mistletoe above all the light sockets. I was never included in family portraits. You said I had a face only a mother could leave. I remember standing in your hallway every other weekend, gazing at you and my stepbrother, 
wearing the framed smiles I knew I would never inherit. I became your biggest fan, chasing your car home from the grocery store, standing outside your bedroom for an autograph or a handshake, explaining, Mom, I've seen every one of your home movies, weekend trip to the zoo, mother-son picnic in Yosemite, and know every one of your mood swings by heart. When you dropped me off at home, I'd brag to dad and his girlfriend about my brush with fame. They'd smile and nod, then shake that wild imagination right out of me. Pretty soon the weekend visits faded into a 19 year carnival line where I waited for you until the sights and sounds of families and laughter made my stomach plunge. That's the year I lost my appetite, then found it in men disguised as getaway cars. Sometimes a tingling sensation sweeps across my face like an amputee's phantom itch. And I realize how much I miss the back of your hand. I know I never apologized for steering you into that marital car crash, but how was I to know they'd pry your legs apart, drag me from the wreckage, my first cries shattering that rear view mirror for a heart. You could have told them. You could have explained. I was just some filthy hitchhiker you never meant to pick up. A greedy little fetus. An accident waiting to happen. Yay. That was wonderful. Your face. So, no, I just, that poem, every time I read it, it's, um, it's haunting and beautiful at the same time. And it's very rare that a piece of art, a piece of work can do that, right? right? So. It's, it's, it's a weird poem uh, to do because um, it does just that. It has people, they don't know what to do with me <laughs> afterwards and they'll come up and be like, I hate that I like that, but I like it <laughs> yeah. and I'm sorry. Like, hey, you know what? I mean, if, if I wasn't able to write it, then there'd be the problem. Like that I wrote it, mm -hmm. like just, you know, that's a good, we're in a good place. It's okay. <laughs> right, but also, you know, we were talking earlier about when someone criticizes your, you know, we, we have critics, right? We have literary yeah, critics. Absolutely. So Can't when have they art without them. Exactly. So when they write about your work, you you know, are they writing about your life or your work? Right. Right. right? And there's a fine line there. Sure. And you know, you're you're taught, especially in MFA programs, uh, that you're only ever to say the speaker of the poem. Not the poet said, like, no, it's the speaker of the mm -hmm. poem says. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't work so hard to separate myself from uh, the speakers of my poems. I do come from numerous perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really important. Um, I like to reveal and uh, sort of indict myself in poems often. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm clearly not a hero of any kind, um, but that I've survived what I have, you know, I tend to get uh, misrepresented as, as the hero, but there's a big difference between surviving and living. Mm -hmm. And um, I've only just been able to learn how to live. Uh, and for anyone who criticizes uh, the poems, I mean, that's, you know, go ahead and do that. That doesn't, that doesn't, uh, harm me in any way. Mm -hmm. I've been harmed. I know mm -hmm. what that is, mm -hmm. you know. And so the writing of it, uh, I, I guess I'm a, one of the lucky writers who just doesn't. When people have anything negative, I I, I just don't give any Attention. value to it. Yeah. I just don't. Right. I don't. I don't mean to be, uh, you know, loved and embraced by everyone. Mm -hmm. That's. <laughs> just be the weirdest thing ever right you know it doesn't make any sense it's a strange place to be there's no one who's it, it maybe sally field but uh, i think we all love sally field i don't because everyone does <laughs> see so there we go <laughs> i'm the asshole. antithesis right? <laughs> um okay so we should tell the audience that I mean, <laughs> I mean you're so celebrated in the poetry <laughs> community and i wasn't able to say that in the intro but nine-time Na National Poetry Slam team member, right? Appeared on eight NPS final stages, coached the New York 
Louder Arts Poetry Slam team to three consecutive final stage appearances, plus the 2009 Women of the World Poetry Slam champion. And the 2011 National oh. Underground Poetry Individual oh. Champion. And that was next on my, <laughs> in my notes. Uh, well, that one was, was more exciting to me because it's your peers judging. Oh, really? None of the, yeah, the rest are random yahoos in the audience. Okay, okay. This is your peers. What if the yahoos are watching the interview? <laughs> yeah, like, Screw the yahoos. Yahoo. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so uh, can we distinguish, like, what is the difference then? This performance poetry versus uh, a poet writing for a book or for reading or? Well, everything I've ever written is, is meant to be uh, read aloud mm -hmm. and uh, that I have books the carry the words is is like having a lipstick in my purse like it's just a vessel to get to one hand from one hand to the other i mean poetry is meant to be oral yeah i don't believe a poem is completed until i've read it aloud and i hear it and it matches all of my intent uh and so uh you know my children have to sit you know i'm like sorry guys it's gonna get rough for a minute there's some poems that are really harsh and i just have to read it i have to hear it is it sonically like proper right. um and so you know being a part of the poetry slam scene taught me a lot about understanding um the the weight and the timing um as we were figuring out poems for me to read i know it's 245 i know it's 308 you know, yes you have to know that you have to know what's going to fit and it's really important um you know, I've been to tons of literary festivals mm -hmm. where I've heard a poem I loved just get butchered. Just mm -hmm. It wasn't given its proper voice mm -hmm. and presence on the stage. It didn't take any shape. It was just kind of a flat, monotone presentation. And that's an injustice. That's like throwing up a painting on the side of the road instead of giving it right. its proper right. matting and like it just it just eh, like it's why would you do that like it deserves to be presented like a piece of art not like sure. passed over like another you know roll call attendance sheet like that's just a weird thing to do um but i mean i definitely uh i anything that i've ever had published i've put on stage Wonderful. Many times over. And I don't write for stage. Um, you know, I read the poems because they've been written. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't write the poems to be read uh, or understood, really, just to be interpreted. But I like to have my interpretation of the poem presented so people can weigh their interpretation. Some of the poems in Pink Elephant people think are about something completely different. And I'm totally fine with that. Like that's, I think poetry, uh, more than any other form of writing, is, uh, allows for that open interpretation, which right. I think is a, is a miraculous freedom for both the reader and uh, I hate when people, so what is this poem about? And, and you know, to challenge, like that's what happens a lot. And uh, I've done it myself at times and I realize it was a jerk move because. Oh, you've asked other poets. Oh like, yeah, hey, so poem? let's read this poem together. And what, so what's it about? <laughs> and then everyone feels put on the spot. Like I yeah. suddenly have to have interpreted this language in a very specific way when, as I said earlier, different words mean such different things to everybody. Sure. And sure. so allow that to kind of like, you know, take the reins and, and or buck off the writer and just run free in the field. And Poetry has the spaces too. I mean, yeah. It has such freedom for the audience to figure out what's going on. Absolutely. You know, with those spaces in between the lines and then the space after the line. and It's why I believe in stopping a poem instead of ending a poem. Because mm. uh, I think that uh, for me, my approach to any story or topic is, is to come usually in the middle uh, when it's about to happen or the aftermath when it's already happened. A lot of my poems aren't ever present action in the way that like something's happening and mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. already happened or uh, it's, it's what's about to drive something to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a lot more exciting. It is. You know? Yeah, I can see that some of the reflective, like, yeah, it's right. reflective and... There's a lot, I, it, it's just, it's easier to dissect mm -hmm. a thing, you know, mm -hmm. a big thing if it's already happened. Mm -hmm. And then the aftermath, I think, is really important. Uh, I have a lot of writing exercises that deal 
with that. Like, what how, what does the weather change by this event happening? Mm -hmm. um, how does time change? And you're like, oh, I don't know. We'll think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and a time of mourning is different than a time of joy, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Clocks, hands, do they become a fist? Do they become teeth? What do they, what changes because of it? And I think that that's a really, um, it's, a good, it's a good place to stay. That, it allows me to, uh, in real life trauma events, just to sort of kind of go through it, go through it and then mm -hmm. afterwards allow myself to really examine what the hell I, all that was and uh, not be driven into the ground by it. I like that you say change because it reminds me even of writing a short story or writing sure. a story, a novel, et cetera, where there must be change, right? Yeah. And, and in poetry, though, it's interesting that you say that. We must have change as well then. Yeah. Right? And the stop allows for the reader to continue on with the story. Mm -hmm. So to not come to like oh, an exact right, end, right. you know, but like here, it stops here. And then where do you go as the reader? Right. You know, what happens um, into the dark and emptying field uh, is a poem about a man who's breaking up with his girlfriend because he's like, you love me too much, you love me enough, I'm gonna move on to the next person. And she's like, oh, I don't, I haven't even loved you all the way yet. And then she mm -hmm. turns around and shows a peephole on the back of her neck. And she goes, if you look inside, there's more love. And then he looks and then he terrorizes her and throws her to the ground and cracks her open to see it all. And then it ends. And so for the reader, it's like, well, did he see, like what happens? And yeah. that's up to you, like I want, you know, I I watched a lot of Alfred Hitchcock. Is what no, really what I have a cinematic eye to an ear. Like I like I like for the everyone hates the movies when they just stop. And I'm like yes because you know like was it the totem? Was it not? Did it fall over? I'm like who cares? It's the best that you don't know. And uh, I I just love that the story gets to continue in the reader. Uh, and I have no idea how it ends. And I like this fantastical element that you're talking about too. Yeah, it's fun. It's Good fantastic. Time. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> okay, before we go, I think um, my students love Letter from My Heart to My Brain and then also the Letter from My Brain to My Heart. More so, Heart to My Brain. I don't know why. There's a preference, right? Um, it's, it's more relatable, I understand. Is it yeah. more relatable? Do you prefer one over the other? Yeah, I prefer the second. Do you really? Of course. Uh, Letter from My Heart to My Brain was a poem I wrote uh, for the the national, uh, what is it, write a poem a day, okay. Naparimo, uh, so national, like right, 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 right. oh God, but yeah. Something some, like some, that. Some, they come up with ni something. Yeah, new. ninja, yeah. ninja <laughs> steel, out of something. Uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's in the month of April, you write a poem a day, and um, I was really going through it. I'm bipolar. And um, when I, you know, I have, when I, my manic states are just writing. Um, and, and so I'll hammer out, hammer out stuff. And uh, I was in that place and I thought, I just wish my brain could just talk to my heart, my heart to my brain. And I'm like, there's my poem. And I wrote it out. Um, it's embarrassing that I wrote it in maybe 10 minutes. You did. Mm-hmm. Fast, really fast. Um, it was not as good as what it is now. I've since taken out a lot of stuff, but it was just, uh, it's its called catalog verse. It's kind of just like line after line. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really hard to memorize because nothing leads you to the next line. Uh, it's just, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's its what I do believe my my heart would say to the, my brain and vice versa. So yeah, I'll, absolutely. So this is all you? This isn't your students, this is you. What do you mean? You're saying, you know, I'm bipolar that, and I wrote this because this is what I wanted my heart, my head to tell my heart, oh, yeah. et cetera. Absolutely. So this is you. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. oh did you think? Oh, we I read see it a different way and oh. here we go back to like the interpretation. Awesome. We read it. Right, because working at Bellevue, well, yes. I, I talk about in the TEDx talk about um, how I, I mean, I never addressed my mental illness mm -hmm. the entire time I worked there. Mm -hmm. And I'm guiding these kids into talking about it and into facing it and, and into kind of owning it mm -hmm. and allowing themselves to rule it instead of the other way around. And that's what they did to their writing. And it wasn't until uh, a couple of years ago where it, long after I had stopped working there and I realized, oh, I have actually never talked about it. But, um, you know, it's, it's a different kind of beast for me because uh, I don't, I don't want to say I'm more avoidant of it, but uh, I'm not burdened the way my students were. I mean, mm -hmm. these are kids on 
antipsychotics and oh, just it's so many, so many um, medications and, and trying to reach through the fog to pull them out and to like to get them to see anything clearly, to write anything uh, was hard. So, so this is kind of homage to them uh, and it was me finally addressing uh, being bipolar. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, would you like me to? I would love for you to read it. Okay. Yes. Which uh, one will in, you read it's first? It's in two parts. Yes. So I'll, I'll, you'll see. Okay. It's okay to hang upside down like a bat, to swim into the deep end of silence, to swallow every key so you can't get out. It's okay to hear the ocean calling your fevered name, to say your sorrow is an opera of snakes, to flirt with sharp and heartless things. It's okay to write, I deserve everything. To bow down to this rotten thing that understands you. To adore the red and ugly queen of it. To admire her calm and steady rowing. It's okay to lock yourself in the medicine cabinet. To drink all the wine. To do what it takes to stay without saying. It's okay to hate God today, to change his name to yours, to want to ruin all that ruined you. It's okay to feel like only a photograph of yourself, to need a stranger to pull your hair and pin you down. It's okay to want your mother as you lie alone in bed. It's okay to brick, to fuck, to flame, to church, to crush, to knife, to rock, to rock, to rock, to rock, to rock and rock. It's okay to wave goodbye to yourself in the mirror, to write, I don't want anything. It's okay to despise what you have inherited, to feel dead in a city of pulses. It's okay to be the whale that never comes up for air, to love best the taste of your own blood. Letter from my brain to my heart. This house is dirty, but comfortable. Behind each crooked door awaits the angry weather of a forgiveless child. I cannot help but admire this horrible power of mine, how each small thing can become a death. The lost house key, a spoiled egg, a howling dog. There is no prayer or pill for this. It is a ruthless botany. I might as well be buried in the yard. I have no one to blame. Not the mother who sang to an empty cradle. Not the dogs of spite who bit my hand. Just this long-legged sorrow who trails my every joy like a dark perfume. You have my permission not to love me. I am a cathedral of dead bolts. And I'd rather burn myself down than change the locks. Having you read this is, it reminds me of, there's a movie with John Keats, it's a John Keats film, <laughs> Bright Star, right? It's like having, <laughs> it's like listening to John Keats read or, oh. you know, Wordsworth, like reading Tintern Abbey or listening, I mean. It's funny, I, I totally steal cadences from all of those. Do you really? <laughs> Yeah. Self same. And uh, just it's just uh, it's it's. I mean, I steal from Daniel McGinn, who's my poetry mentor, and uh, he's who taught me mm -hmm. measure and like mm -hmm. nuance mm -hmm. and and allowing the poem to to walk around the room. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't just be hammered into one section. It should be a person that's just moving through the room. And uh, but I you know I, I've listened to recordings of poets and uh sylvia plath yeah. too oh daddy daddy yeah. like just the way yeah. she i mean the i mean that it's, it's so ghostly and yeah. it's such an interesting thing to to hear the poem kind of attach itself to the speaker and and become this animated spirit that i mean it's 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 so obvious that it's not just the poet it's the poem itself right. you know breathing and taking in some uh, deep breaths and sharpening its teeth and that's a very exciting thing to hear and that's what I try to do when I read mm -hmm. I want the poems to be given their own 
individual personalities. Um, they are all children. Mm -hmm. They're all my children. You have many children. On, to yeah, on top of the five, right. I actually On top of have. the five that you really do have. Holy smokes. Yeah, that's wonderful, though. Thanks. Yeah. It's wild, too, that students, I, I just, this is one of the poems that I thought for sure was not ever going to see the light of day. Uh, didn't think it was accessible at all. My students love it. And uh, I've learned on the Tumblr that uh, the closing, yes. which is, what is it? Uh, you have my permission not to love me. That is like 20,000 different shares, which is like, mm. what? And it's so interesting too, because I don't think that they know that that's the voice of a brain, mm -hmm. of a mentally right. ill brain. Right. I think it has right. more to do with like, oh, oh he doesn't yeah. love, you have my permission not to love me. Like, right. It's more about that. But, and that's fine too, like open to interpretation. It's just interesting that some, that anyone can hear that and, and kind of attach that to anything in their life. Sure. When to me, I felt like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going I'm inside doing. myself and I'm revealing right. so right. much. Uh, and ends so, up still being universal in some That's unfathomable true. way. I mean, it reminds me of Toni Morrison who said that we, we go to books to find ourselves. Oh. I mean, so oh, we're yeah. going to the, it, people are going to your poem and all those, this is you, this is yourself. They're finding themselves and then, you know, yeah. taking it as their own. It's interesting. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm so glad you came and you know this. So thank you, Rachel, for coming to College of DuPage. Um, students who want to keep in touch and anybody who wants to keep in touch with Rachel, those of you listening, watching, etc., rachelmckibbins.com and then latest book about, to, it's out now. It's yeah. just, it was on back order when, yeah. and now, yeah, so quite popular. It's Into the Dark and Emptying Field. You got it. Sweet. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much.